five. Recording now. African angel goddess. No ethereal illuminations for her. She was always earthbound, attracted to nightlife, music, places where folks were dancing so hard, bodies rain sweat. African angel, mother of humanity, Lucy definitely isn't her name. See her wearing silver kicking ass alligator boots, get right in my face shouting, girl, get the hell up. She wears her halo glinting across her delta-wide forehead, the harp and horn thing she left in heaven, but she'll walk you through any adversity, knowing all pathways in and out of hell. She can visit wearing many disguises, rags so dense, only the gold of her face is visible. She speaks Mandarin, Bantu, and Twi, same sweet mother tongue to her. We'll meet you at the river Styx, board we're crossing over in that rickety ass boat. Might even give you a second chance cause it's rebirth and life that interests her. She's in the smoke where women gather, bearing arms, refusing to be raped, murdered, and made refugees from their homes. Woman of war in Liberia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone. Woman in Abuja, Cape Town, Harlem, Arusha. New woman everywhere, gathered to give birth to a future we can inhabit. African angel in the middle of our middle passage, etching freedom over us, kicking us forward. New woman, change forever. Wild child. Basquiat, you are forever 27. The many ways you wrote upon canvas, family trees mixed with Congo crosses, glyphs and incantations of every weary black man. Faces Alegoa inhabited, that bluish black man, bulging eyes wrapped upon life, bearing his teeth upon the hoary land, could be grinning, could be screaming. Drawing and redrawing that squarish head covered with, in dreadlocks onto concrete walls, train stops and storefronts. The surface did not matter, only that you left your sign. Everything was fuel, everything. Old to Iyansa. Iyansa. Austere gates of divine mystery, which you so aptly guard, are now flung open, accepting so many from the hospitals, nursing homes, streets, and transit. The lines between the city of the living and the city of the dead are now blurred, open for quick crossings without rituals or ceremonies of leave-taking and long goodbyes. Once you were content to be the keeper of secrets, wearing a rose-colored head wrap, quietly attending to the new returnees, your legion of invisible ones always willing to aid the living. Now the city where you live has so many dead, you have taken up residence in parking lots with truckloads of former husbands, wives, grandmothers, fathers, sons, and daughters. In this America, your power is unquantifiable as we count lives lost and transfigured forever. You now stronger than you ever intended to be. Your tears flowing unceasing. Fight to keep as many as you can alive. Iyansa, goddess whose gifts can both save, can both save us and give others a quick merciful end. We dream of a different time, yet unborn. Purple hued tempests fly all around the earth where only a hint of your power is mirrored. Iyansa, fierce owner of the ancestral realm, bless the day you can close your gates. Thank you, Thank you for the wonderful reading. This is uh, Jeffrey Bernard Allen in conversation with poet and quilt maker Jacqueline Johnson. Thank you for joining me so much. Oh, good to be here. Good to be here. Uh, it seems like it's a high moment in poetry, given that the inauguration was last week and um, we had uh, the, the inaugural poet, Amanda Gorman Reed, the young woman. I wonder if you have any thoughts about the, the reading or her poem and such uh, 
there have been some, some kinds of controversies around it. Uh, but both she's been both celebrated and vilified, and, and at the same time, I would say. Uh, yeah, she's taken a lot of heat, but she commanded the moment that was given her. Um, she, uh, I thought she was fabulous. She looked fabulous. She sounded good. Um, her poem spoke to everyone. Her poem had what I call the right register, okay. um, which, which, which means that it, trans it was able to go across the culture. Um, I would say um, at 22, she gave a wonderful reading of her own work. Um, I could not have done that at 22. Um, and I'll, I'll say in general, the inaugural poem is generally kind of, um, and, and, and this is not referencing her, but generally the poem, um, it can be anywhere from disastrous to just a clunky mess. She, I think she avoids that. Um, the, the, you want your words to uh, be accessible to everyone. Um, and I think she manages to speak uh, uh, across the culture. Um, not every poet can do that. Um, and I'll, I'll use another example. Um, and and um, I'm, I'm in a church that has three choirs. One is uh, a choir that sing, sings just classical, almost operatic stuff. And then we have like the soul choir where everybody's having a good time. And then we have a few soloists. And there's a woman who, I wouldn't call her instrument perfect, mm -hmm. but she's the one person when she sings, the whole congregation is up. Yeah. She commands the whole room. Okay. That's how, a, that's Amanda. Okay, that's great. So uh, what about the state of poetry in America? Do you, do you feel that um, poetry generally has an audience or what, what do you feel about it as a, as a working poet yourself? I think the audience for, poet, for poetry is poets. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm just going to be honest. I think poets are supporting poets. Um, there are, and of course, people are are going across the culture. But I think what I'm excited about in American poetry is just to see um, the 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 amount of work that's being published, the amount of quality work. Um, when my uh, last book came out in 2015, there are about 12 other books coming out at the same time. I have never seen that before. Okay. And so now I can't, I can't even keep up with the level of production that's going on. Um, I think a good portion of the audience, some of it's in the academy uh, and some of it still resides in our neighborhoods and our community. Um, but I think the average reader <laughs> is another poet. I'll just be frank. And it would seem too like, um there's been an explosion of African-American poetry. And I wonder if in part that's been due to organizations like Kavi Kanem and- Oh, sure, sure. I was thinking about the, you know, my apprenticeship as a poet was in uh, workshops where you had all of the genres at the table. Oh. Um, you know, the fact that we have an organization that's just devoted to African-American poetry is, is a wonderful accomplishment. Um, and, you know, uh, like I said, the work is seriously being um, written and produced. Um, and I'm really impressed with the quality. Um, they're, they're almost arty in terms of the covers and the paper that's being used, but really right. fine, fine production work being done on both sides from the creative as well as a, a, the product that people end up with. Okay, could you uh, talk more about your um, development as a poet or maybe I'll ask you differently, uh, which came first, the, your work as an artist, as a quilt maker, or uh, your work as a poet? Um, I'm going to say that um, in my family, um, the, the, what came first was song. What came first was music. Okay. Um, and I only know that because my aunts told me. Um, okay. um, I was singing all over the place. Oh, okay. um, and my mom passed when I was four. Wow. And uh, my aunt said that some of that voice went with her. 
Um, so it's, uh, you know, in, in, in the course of my life, there, there are flashings of, of visual art showing up. Um, but I'm in a family that, you know, people are practical. So that beautiful swan that I had sculpted out of clay, by the time it gets home, the head's broken and it becomes an ashtray, you know? <laughs> right. No, basically nobody gives a hoop <laughs> about the about the flashes that I'm showing my showing, but um, I would say that by by the time I'm I'm a teenager, I'm writing. Um, I'm I'm writing poems. I'm publishing poems in, in Spanish. My first poem was published in Spanish. Oh, wow. I'm so hungry to get published that I that I uh, respond to a call for work in Spanish wow. at like at like 16, you know. Um, but truly, uh, I spend most of um, my 20s working on my craft, working, uh, developing. Um, uh, the poetry. And I don't know if it's from an event um, that I get a glimpse of uh, uh, the Adinkra symbols that are from the Akan, yes, uh, yes. the Ashanti, and they're the Akan language. And for some reason, I decide I want to make them. I want to make them. And I have a friend who's an artist. So she challenges me and she starts showing me, you know, I'm painting them, I'm drawing them. She says, you have to do it in every medium. And in, in the process of us holding our conversation, a, a workshop comes up. Um, they couldn't get children to come, so they've opened it up for adults. And it's a silk screening workshop. And I study with um, Emmett Wigglesworth and Otto Neils. So I, I learned silk screening and I do silk screening on fabric on on um, paper and I'm silk screening the adinkras at this point and this is 1983 okay. and and nobody knows what they you know they're not really in the culture at that point so I have Asian people looking at me because it's a language right. and so I'm wearing my little shawls and things and many different people are responding to them um what happens is one day I have a piece of cloth left over and I'm like, let me try and make a quilt. And I don't really know what a quilt is, but I do my version of a quilt. And that begins my conversation um, with, with the quilt as, as an object. Um, um, and it's maybe another five years before I actually take a formal quilting class. Okay. Um, and it's it's a it's an addictive form. So at this point, you know, my fabric stash is like at warehouse level. <laughs> I just wow. got way, I got a lot of fabric. <laughs> wow. Wow. So um uh, obviously you went on to study quilt making more. And uh to what degree have you formally studied the tradition of African American quilt making? Um, I mostly have have um for the longest time, I was just doing my own thing. Okay. Um, and I took that one class and it's a long time before I take another one. And I'm, you know, I'm not completely self-taught, but I'm following what, what, what moves through my work is a conversation with the photograph. Cause I have photo in my early quotes, there's a lot of photographs okay. and I'm doing my own thing. I'm, I love the traditional form but I'm more of an art quilter. So I'm, I'm making my own, I'm, I'm following my own designs uh, and adding the tradition to that. And, and, um, and I think I arrive at the right time because there's a whole bunch of us doing the same, holding the same conversation in different ways. Um, and I can say, you know, in that same time period, I might spend five hours silk screening and then I would turn around and write. Oh, okay. So the two things are happening simultaneously. But what's what's um, uh, wonderful is that there's no like demand. I'm not, I'm, none of this stuff has to be in the public. So there's, there's not that pressure. I can just develop and, and explore. Okay. You know, uh, this is a really basic question, but some people may not know what a quilt actually is. Can can you can you explain 
No, that's important. That's important. A quilt is comprised of three layers. There's a top layer that could be, that could have um, a pieced top or an applique top or even a painted top. And in between that is batting and the batting could be cotton, it could be wool, uh, it could be old clothes. Traditionally, African-American women just took whatever they had and put it in the middle of the quilt. And then there's a back and the back could be plain. It could be another design all to itself. And the stitch work needs to go in between all three layers um, in order for it to technically be a quilt. Okay, so uh, one thing a quilt maker has to learn is something about stitching, I would imagine. Yes, and uh, some people work by hand, some people work by machine. I do both. Um, I don't have any time, so I gotta, <laughs> I gotta get there fast. Um, so. So what is your process like from start to finish with a particular quilt? Does it, uh, does it begin with the um, image you have in your mind or does it begin? I, will, I always, I always have to have an image. If I don't have an image, I don't have anything. But that image could be um, uh, brought about by uh, a, a political event, uh, uh, an event of, of nature. Um, when, the, um, when the earthquake happened in Haiti, um, it, it, it just traumatized me. And I, um, I did about, two or three months of research uh, on Haiti. I, I looked at uh, what Zora Neale Hurston and uh, Catherine Dunham were doing because they were both in Haiti at the same time on different projects. And, 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 I, and I looked at the history and, and, then I, uh, and then I just started, and then I decided, I had to decide what my uh, colors, what the colors were gonna be and red and white and African-American quilting are healing colors. So I wanted to do a healing quilt for, for Haiti. And then um, it's, a, it's a, what you call a, a, med, a medallion quilt. And a medallion quilt pattern is basically a square surrounded by concentric squares. Uh -oh. um, okay. And so do you, um... Do you are always work with um, pre-fabricated material? That is to say, do you do any like dyeing of, of cloth? Um, yeah, um, one of the things that happened when I learned silk screening is I also learned how to do, I had already, I already knew how to do tie-dye, but I also learned how to do batik. Um, I studied with, um, uh, Yeme, who's one of the uh, uh, twin seven sevens family out of Nigeria, they they actually had them had her come to the Museum of Natural History and teach a class. Um, but I I will sometimes for babies I will sometimes do a tie dye. I do what they call whole cloth quilts. Like I don't break the fabric for babies. It's just one piece. Um, so one of the first quilts I gave away. Um, uh, uh, was to Terry Macmillan. Oh. And that quilt was so gorgeous. It was so incredibly gorgeous. But I tie dyed it like three times. And then I bought some really expensive lace and I put a piece of my Adinkra cloth on the back. Um, and I told her, I said, if this thing falls apart, keep the lace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, so the, yeah, no, I, I actually do. Um, I use fabricated, but I also will sometimes make uh, make the fabric myself. In terms of your process, how long does it usually take for, for a quilt for you to make the quilt from start to finish? Um, that has changed over the years. Um, and so, you know, I spend more time thinking the quilt through now. Okay. Uh, in my earlier process, I would I would be halfway through going, I don't know how to do this. What is this? So I was I was teaching myself then, and now I spend more time. I draw the quilt out. I'll draw it out several times, um, and then um, I had a, I had access to a lot of technology at one point. So I might draw it, copy it, cut it, draw it again, and then start cutting the fabric. And I would make my templates or I'm cutting it directly from the design and then laying it on the fabric. And it would take me, 
sometimes it could take me a week. Like the quote, I have a quote I did for Obama, um, President Obama, and um, um, you actually gave the quote to President Obama. No, no, there was a, a quilt show in his honor, which I actually didn't get in, oh, but that quilt okay. took me a week. Okay. So sometimes it, the the I the, the the moment from idea to execution could be really quick, and then sometimes it's several months. Okay. So. Right. And so you have uh, exhibited your work. Like, what's the ex exhibition process like? Well, I've been working um, with a few curators, one uh, notably uh, Dr. Carolyn Mazumi, who's like uh, the high priestess of African-American quilting. Okay. And so um, my very first quilt show with, um, with her went on for three, went, the show actually traveled for four years. Okay. Um, wow. So, you know, I'll give her a quilt and the quilt goes on and lives, lives a, a much larger life. Um, and I've enjoyed, uh, 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 working with her, um, and, you know, the, the quilts are, are seen in museums all over the place. I, I mean, my favorite, um, um, show for, um, it was, um, textural rhythms, um, quilting the jazz tradition. And we had a, a wonderful opening at the Reginald Lewis Museum in Baltimore. It was just fabulous. Wow. But that but that show, and it actually came here to uh, the Folk Art Museum okay. uh, and, and had, a nice, had a nice run. Okay. So in terms of your process now, I mean, uh, what is it like as to be an artist who works in these two different mediums um it, uh, it's how um you, how do you balance the life the craft um i don't uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay um they you know um becoming a professional art quilter damn near broke me because oh. i really um you know i was just walking my writing path Okay. And to take on a whole nother form that was equally demanding is very hard. So at, in, at this time, I try to uh, give the writing its due because um, that's my lead form. Um, and I do the quilting around that. Um, if there's a call for work or a call for an exhibition, I will try and respond. But for example, um, this summer there was a call for work um, around Black Lives Matter issues. And I had a piece that I was actually built, building the quilt. I was putting it together. And then at the same time, I had to put an issue of About Place Journal together. Yeah. So I looked up and I said, I'm not gonna make the quilt deadline because I only had 30 days. So I let that go. And I just concentrated on doing the editorial work for, for About Place Journal. So sometimes, sometimes I have to make those decisions, but um, I, I usually do it uh, with the writing leading. Um, and and um, unless it's a, um, an extraordinary thing, and then I'll just jump on it and try to do both things at the same time. But in the past, um, I would take a week off from work to get something done or a few days off so that I could just focus. Okay. I would be remiss if I didn't say that uh, you also are a fiction writer. And for those who don't know, um, usually people who write poetry don't write fiction and vice versa. I mean, uh, poets tend to write prose essays, um, but uh, not fiction. So and from what I know about your fiction, you, um, could be characterized as what people call an Afrofuturist. If can I say that, or I'll just put that out there. <laughs> um, I think <laughs> there are I think there are elements of Afrofuturism in in my fiction, um, but my fiction goes the gamut, um, and I have very little of it published. Um, but um, I think my 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 themes are all over the place, but the work that's been coming forward has, has been the Afrofuturistic work. Um, but that's not the only stuff I do. Okay, so what do you uh, think about this whole idea of Afrofuturism? Uh, do you find that it uh, 
there is some validity to, to our lives as black people or to our literary tradition, or is it just, um, you know, some rubric that critics have invented or some kind of marketing strategy? Um, I think it's ours. I think we invented it. Um, I, you know, when you, you know, traditionally when you thought of the future, it wasn't, it didn't include black people. Right. You know, so we, we are imagining ourselves and, bring, and bringing ourselves into this moment. You know, every movie you watch, the black character is the first one to get shot. Exactly. You know, we, we all, we all, or, or get taken out some kind of way. So we sacrifice just to, ourselves for white people <laughs> in the movie or something like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, we definitely have to subvert those narratives. So I, I, I just kind of feel like um, that field is exploding, speculative fiction is exploding. In a, in a wonderful way um and and i think it's part of our project in this moment to 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 not only reimagine ourselves but just to create the moment that that we want that we need that we deserve you know yeah i i personally feel that uh, i just call it the black fantastic i think it's uh, yes really exciting uh, what's happening in, on many fronts both in film and television uh, but also in on the page and fiction and so on. You know, I think it's all very exciting. And then, of course, there's been critical work about it as well. So, yeah. Yeah, no, Pete, Pete scholars are doing their work, yeah. and and the creative folks are doing theirs as well. So it's it's a it's a very interesting moment for um, our art. Um, uh, I feel like our our culture and the arts are ascending in this moment. Yeah, I think I would also be remiss in not saying that um, you were born and raised in New York and that you live in New York. Uh, you live in Brooklyn and of course, uh, New York has been so hard hit by the pandemic. Well, the world has been hard hit, but New York um, has been especially hard hit. And I just wonder what, um, what your experience has been like uh, during the pandemic in the city. You know. Okay. Um, I'll just correct you. I was born in Philadelphia. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, I think the pandemic um, uh, has been devastating. Um, it has been, um, uh, uh, I, I was just in the city on uh, Sunday and observed that most of my favorite haunts my restaurants, my coffee places, uh, my little arty shops are gone. Wow. You know, the place where you could get, you know, the uh, the guy that sold, all, you know, all the old LPs, gone. Um, so a lot of what, um, some of, the, a lot of the shops that made New York known are gone. Wow. Um, and it's, and it's not being talked about as much, but, but, Retail is taking a huge hit in the city. Um, I think it's, I've been moving around the entire pandemic. Like I go out like every other day. Okay. Um, um, I live over a smoker and I gotta breathe. Okay. <laughs> I just gotta leave my home and get some fresh air. Okay. Um, I, th I think that it's been hard to watch uh, people lose their livelihoods, their income. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, I'm a child of science. I'm alive because of science and God. I was born seven months early. The science was advanced enough so that I could live. Yes. And to watch how we have so poorly handled this. We had a two month lead yeah, and we completely blew it. Right. That's, it's horrific to watch. I'm hoping that um, the Biden presidency can make up or at least begin to regain ground. Um, and I think they're making the right steps, um, but the impact on our culture is devastating. I mean, I, I'm, you know, we're all uh, survivors of the AIDS pandemic. And here we are in this second one, which is far more devastating. Um, I, I, you know, I know my city will recover, but it's going to take a moment. It's a few years. It's a few years. How has the pandemic affected your creative process? Um, quite frankly, it, I shut down. 
Oh. I, I shut down. It doesn't mean I stopped, but I did, but I did shut down to some degree. Um, and you know, some of this has to do with the ways that we protect ourselves from the noise of the world. There's so much incredible noise going on. Yeah. Um, so now I'm starting to play more, you know, I'm, um, and I'm, and I've been editing all along. Um, but I was making mask. I was making mask in, in the early part of the pandemic. Okay. And then, at, and then at one point I looked up and I was like, I hate making masks. <laughs> you mean, um, protective. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I hate making masks. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> I'm like, but I still do it. Um, but, uh, I had to evolve a process around that. Um, cause I was taking way too long to make them, but I, I just think, um, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Well, thank you for sitting down to talk with me. It's uh, it's been wonderful, and I should mention that uh, in this issue of Tank 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 Magazine, you will have both poems and images of your quotes. So, yes, looking forward. Looking forward to. It. Thank you again. So. All right.